great idea of the 20th century, probably one of the best ideas was materialism. The idea that um, the best place to find identity and happiness and status was in material things. Because materialism is the value system that's underpinned consumerism, which is of course the practice that's underpinned the fabulous world we live in today and the success of capitalism. Lucky us, I can write a book with a title like Stuffication in English or Onspullen in uh, Dutch. And instead of people thinking, these are ridiculous made up words, they get it because we all have too much stuff. So what um, I believe in, and this is all backed up by science, I should probably mention that, is that what we need to do is have a, a revolution in our thinking, shift our thinking from being materialistic to being experientialist. Instead of thinking best place to find happiness, identity, status and meaning is in things, in stuff, in material goods, it's in experiences instead. It doesn't matter that much what kind of experiences you go for. But there are certain things about experiences that make them better than material goods at giving us status and giving us happiness. So once you start to think about those, you can think about the kind of experiences you should have. So for example, one of the reasons why experiences are better than material goods is simply that they bring us closer to other people. And happiness exists in the experience of spending time with people you love and who love you. So if you play tennis, bah, you can play tennis against a wall, but that isn't tennis. Tennis is with somebody else. And there's another aspect to, to let's, take, let's go with playing tennis for a moment. When you play tennis, you can't think about a deadline. You can't think about what other work you have to do. You don't think about the conversation you had with a difficult boss or a friend who's let you down or a, you know, an issue that you have because you're in the zone. You're, you know, the focus that you have is hitting the ball back. And they talk about, this is a guy from uh, uh, an American psychologist called Mihai Cheek Sent Mihai who came up with the idea of flow back in the 90s. Flow, being in the zone or what Eckhart Tolle would call being in the present. The magic of experiences they bring you into that moment. So if you go climbing, you're worried that you're going to fall. You've got, to, you've got to hold on. If you're skiing, you've got to focus. But equally, if you're singing in a choir, if you're making love, if you're walking along a beach with your toes in icy cold water, or even in warm water, diving into warm water, or if you're cycling down a hill, but experiences don't have to be physical. They could be uh, going to Venice or Rome and seeing fabulous art, going to the Frick Museum in New York and seeing exquisite art or it could be reading a book and of course a book is a wonderful example of an experiential good because a good book will transport you to somewhere so you're very much a mental experience um, the other thing is that sometimes people can look at the way that I describe experientialism and the experiences that make it up and it can feel um, selfish it can feel a little bit like hedonism in that idea that, oh, okay, so you could just go down to the pub with friends, or you could drink or get high, and that would be acceptable. This, this isn't correct. This isn't just a, about the hedonism of happiness. This is about the eudaimonia of happiness, from the Greek words you and daimon, good, and daimon, your spirit. So eudaimonia is very much about, in modern terms, life satisfaction, very much about expressing who you are. One of the most important things for happiness is the idea of competence and expressing who we are through challenge. So purpose is incredibly important. Even if it's come back to the example of tennis, playing tennis, there's a purpose, a really short purpose, to win. But there's also a longer term purpose, to be healthy. You know, the operating mode of our system has been, if you get more stuff, you will be happy. And I want to not break that, but develop it and turn it on its head slightly. So it's a move from materialism to experientialism, still supporting consumerism. It's really interesting to me how many people today say they don't like consumerism. If you say to a group of people, do you like throwaway culture? What's the answer? It's always the same. Oh, it's awful, it's bad for the environment. These companies that make things to break are evil. But actually, throwaway culture, which is you know, part and parcel of, of, of materialism, is the idea that's given us the magic of today's world. The magic where 
we all have enough pairs of shoes, we have enough clothes, we have enough food on the table. So we're really lucky to sit here and say, consumerism is bad, it's an awful practice, you need to be less consumerist. Just to be clear, I'm really aware of the issues that come with consumerism, the stress, the anxiety, the depression that seems to come hand in hand with the success of materialistic consumer societies. There is so much evidence that shows there's a correlation between the two. If you want to change human behavior, the worst thing to do is say don't. If you say stop doing something and try and stop, it won't happen. This is why um, dieting programs fail. Substitution is absolutely key. The behavioral psychologists have discovered that if you want to move somebody from here and stop them doing that thing, the best thing to do is to substitute what they do. So people that think, wow, I need to be less materialistic. I'm gonna stop buying things. They will for a bit. And then it will come to Saturday morning and they've worked hard and bugger it, they earn that money, they work hard, it's their right to go spend that money. And if you tell them don't be materialistic, don't be a consumer, wow, I think they're a bit stuck. And then they're going to feel guilty, they'll feel bad, and then of course they'll feel naughty when they spend, and being naughty is fun, and there you go, you have that cycle, it's really negative, it's not positive. It doesn't help them get out of that process. The interesting thing about this idea is A, it's happening, and B, I'm trying to affect that change and speed the move up. If you say to somebody, be a consumer, it's fine, but spend less on stuff, but spend more on experiences, they can continue to be excited by the new, which is a perfectly natural thing to be, um, and they can substitute their spending on stuff for spending on experiences instead. And what will then happen if they just make that very small step and I'm stealing here from psychologists like BJ Fogg at Stanford, you know, tiny habits is the way to do this. All of a sudden, you'll start to spend less on stuff and have more experiences, and then you'll get the magic of the experiences, and the magic of the experiences is you'll get into flow more. You'll have better relationships with friends, um, and you'll start to live a more fabulous, enjoyable, fun life. Lots of people that rail against consumerism forget that the iPhone in their pocket and the fact they have all these comfortable clothes that fit them, shoes in half sizes, um, clothes that don't cost a fortune, is the magic of consumerism that's given us you know, material well-being. And trying to break consumerism, there needs to be something else. And the magic of consumerism is we have this abundant world. And if we shift our spending from um, goods to experiences, we will keep money flowing through the economy. If we keep money flowing the, through the economy, we can continue on a path of growth for GDP, which is an important part of our well-being. I also believe it's useful, I believe, with what Sun Tzu said, that in times of peace, prepare for war, and there are certain people out there um, who have guns and might want to attack our wonderful way of living, and I think it's important to protect that. If you want to protect your way of living, I don't think this is deep paranoia, but you know, if you think about it, it's not so long ago there was war in Europe. Um, lucky us, we don't have it anymore. Um, we need to be prepared for that, and to have that, we need an economy. And an economy requires people to spend money, so consumerism just needs, in my view, a reboot and a switch from the material to the experiential. I had a period of buying loafer shoes. Do you call them loafers? Um, and I don't know why, but I must have bought one pair and liked them. I thought they were the thing to have. And I ended up with like seven or eight pairs of these shoes, which I never wore because I don't need seven. Or eight. I have two feet. And one of the magical things, actually, why experiences are better than material goods is something called hedonic adaptation. We get used to material goods quite quickly. Experiences we get used to much more slowly, and they build. If you get another pair of jeans, it's just another pair of jeans. If you go to a concert and then go to another concert, it builds on the last one. When it comes to my child's birthday, I don't buy her lots of toys. Um, I take my kids to the Natural History Museum in London. I mean, they do have things, they're children, so they want to have dinosaurs. They want to play with dinosaurs. I'm not anti-stuff, I'm anti too much and the wrong stuff. And, and people, sometimes people do say to me, hold on, but I can afford this stuff and the experiences. I work hard, I deserve it. And I'm fine if that's what people want to do. But I was able this summer to take a, 
a significant period of time abroad with my children going to the beach because I don't waste my money on so much stuff anymore. The key thing first up is it's really easy to think I won't spend on material goods, I'll put the money away and I'll spend it on experiences, which is very dangerous, especially when you're first doing this because I think you need to experience the joy of an experience. So if you come to the weekend and you were going to, let's say usually you would have spent 200 euros or 100 euros or 50 euros on a new pair of shoes, I think it's really important that you go spend that money. Take your girlfriend to lunch, take a friend to the cinema, go a place you've never been to before and all of a sudden you have this, oh, hold on, the money's gone as it used to be, but what have I got now? I've got a memory. One of the things that inspired me to write the book was um, a, a note that my grandfather gave me on the day he died. And in the note, it said, memories live longer than dreams. And I think what he meant is what matters in life is um, the, the memories that come, from, um, that come from experiences, what you do matters more than kind of materialistic dreams and getting more stuff. That's my reading of it.